Cities After is a bi-monthly podcast about the future of cities. Grounded in our daily urban struggles, it is part dystopian and part utopian. My intention is to entice your civic imagination into action, because we know that a more just and sustainable urban future is possible. This is Miguel Robles Duran, and I dare you to imagine our cities after. COVID, COVID. global warming, Extract. gentrification, Exploitation. homelessness, Neophagy. racism, colonialism, patriarchy, hunger, police brutality, private property, capitalism, capitalism, capitalism. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. I want to start today's podcast with a few startling statistics that will help frame this episode as I address the contradictions of the contemporary American suburban divide and speculate on some dystopian and utopian post-COVID scenarios. According to a research report I recently read put out by the Federal Home Loan Mortgage Corporation, better known as Freddie Mac, between 2018 and 2020, the American housing stock deficit increased by approximately 52%, from 2.5 million housing units to 3.8 million. To some, these numbers might not come as a big surprise. If you followed housing prices throughout the pandemic, you saw that home prices increased an average of 27% across the country. According to the website Realtor.com, homes in Montana rose in price a mind-boggling 57%. Idaho, 46%. Utah and Nevada, 37%. Homeowners in California saw their average home equity soar to $119,000. And this is just in 2021. All of these totals to more than $9 trillion. Let me repeat, $9 trillion that were added to the total value of the US housing market. And this is just in one year. And this trend will continue. Zillow is projecting an 11% rise for 2022, and so on, and so on. So where is this mind-blowing sum of money? Well, according to the statistics, it's been held by a combination of real estate corporations, transnational finance capital, wealthy landlords, as well as by a share of old single homeowners. But what about the shares of the average working millennial, or the person who's barely getting by. As Lori Anderson bluntly put it in her 2010 album, Homeland. The person who's watching shows about people with problems. The person who's part of the 60% of the US population, 1.3 weeks away, 1.3 paychecks away from a shelter. In other words, a person with a problem. The great majority of the 5.8 million homes that make up the American housing deficit would, in theory, belong exactly to who Laurie Anderson calls a person with a problem. And according to the real estate industry, if a person with a problem will ever own a home, it will most certainly be in the suburbs. Where dilapidated homes are affordable, where land can still be had for the cheaps, and where mass, low-cost, cookie-cutter style construction can still be made. This is simply because all persons with problems have been de facto priced out of urban areas. If they want to own a home, all projections tell us it most certainly won't be anywhere near cities. If millennials still have the dream of owning a home in or close to a city, I am sorry to tell them 
exactly what activists from the Spanish 15M movement were shouting in the streets some years ago. No vas a tener casa en la puta vida. Let me translate. You are not owning a house in your fucking life. But the real estate industry tells us that the desire for a homeowner lifestyle isn't going away. And that desire is stronger than the desire to live in cities. Even more, suburban home ownership continues to be seen by most Americans as a vehicle for class mobility, as the startup for the wealth accumulation and security of a family. The National Association of Home Builders attributes the pandemic shift in construction from metro areas to new suburbs to a search for affordable housing, to a search for more space, and of course, to the pervasive desire of owning a home. For the millions of people with problems that have been priced out of cities, those that are exhausted of living paycheck to paycheck, being overexploited, without savings, and without any prospect of building equity. For those, the dream of suburban living might seem like the solution to their problem. Or is it? I'm sorry to be a dream crusher again, but this isn't the socioeconomic context of the 1940s suburban development that I talked about two episodes ago. Double-income millennial couples with little to no savings will continue to earn depressed wages. And sadly, there are no future projections of a turnaround. Transportation costs continue to soar. The same with basic maintenance services and infrastructures, health, utilities, and education. Inflation is turning basic daily needs into luxuries. And if this wasn't enough of a blow to a whole generation, the real estate industry is beginning to invest more and more in developing rental homes in the suburbs. Or as discussed by Andrew Ross in the previous episode, in trailer parks, long-stay motels, and short-term rentals. Because the industry knows that many won't be able to afford a home. Even in the distant plains of the new suburbs, so millennials can have more space and spend less for the rental home, motel, or trailer in the suburb. And yes, statistics will tell you that suburban jobs are growing faster, but the growth of well-paying jobs continues to be in cities, in average about 46% higher pay than a low-density suburbs, according to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. And this disparity will only continue to grow. Cities will be, for the near future, much more wealthy than its sprawling counterparts. To follow up on these issues, I will take a closer look into five of the many contradictions that the future of American suburbanization will bring. Contradiction number one. On one hand, the farther from a major metropolitan area an existing suburb is, the more common is for them to reproduce a conservative, patriarchal, racially segregated, and individualist lifestyle of the classic American suburbia that I described two episodes ago. On the other hand, the closer a suburb is to a major metropolitan area, the more socially diverse, educated, wealthy, and inclusive its population becomes. One can easily see this general pattern in the results of the 2020 presidential election. The infamous blue versus red maps and the numerous educated versus uneducated, wealthy versus poor graphics displayed by analysts all over the media. It is said by many that the future of the Democratic Party is clearly with younger, more diverse, and more educated populations. However, to afford a home, the younger and diverse generations 
are forced to dwell far from the social, cultural, and economic opportunities that are offered by major metropolitan areas, and are pushed to live even farther out from the suburban towns of old. Perhaps side to side to rural edges where books are burned, where white Christian nationalism thrives, or if they get lucky, where the wild country begins. Contradiction number two. Even though the desire for more space and a detached, calmer environment continues to be a major attraction for suburban living, the largest proportion of younger generations still want to live inside or close to existing cities. Apart from the economic and social contradictions that I just mentioned, forcing millennials and persons with problems to live farther out of metropolitan centers will clearly exacerbate the access gap to quality basic services that support general social well-being. Schools, health clinics, hospitals, markets, sports, leisure and recreational facilities, cultural centers, libraries and emergency services. Gone are the times when the federal government made serious investments in proper social services leaving these efforts to private businesses and developers of the kind that render Walmarts and places like that as the cultural, leisure, health and education centers of the American outer suburbs. Contradiction number three. Remote work has made it possible to live large in the suburbs, so they say. The luring of high-income earners from major metropolitan centers has become a major objective of those small cities and suburban towns with the means of offering cash, property incentives, working spaces, outdoor recreational packages to those that have been priced out of large cities or, as some say, are tired of them. I quote, Get paid to do what you love in a place that you love. Communities across the U.S. are paying remote workers to relocate. End of quote. This is the slogan of MakeMyMove.com, a website dedicated to help people move out of expensive cities. According to this site, 53 communities in 24 states and Puerto Rico are trying to lure new residents by offering cash, covering moving costs, or providing other kinds of incentives. Lewisburg, Virginia is offering $20,000. Southwest Michigan is offering $15,000. West Lafayette, Indiana $8,245. Newton, Iowa, $12,500. Stillwater, Oklahoma, $7,500. And the list continues. Inter-suburban competition is real and it's becoming even tighter. With a few areas winning high-income earners and others earning low-wage or soon-to-be unemployed populations. However, places that place a high bid for remote workers. Inter-suburban competition is real and becoming tighter and tighter, with a few areas winning high-income earners and others earning low-wage or soon-to-be unemployed population. However, places a high bid for remote workers, they should also understand that this COVID trigger trend continues to be shaped by employers to their advantage. For example, questions like, who in a company should have access to permanent remote or flexible work settings? Should the pay be the same if an existing worker relocates to a more affordable region? Should new remote workers be paid the same as local ones? 
What about all the local benefits that companies offered, like healthcare and well-being packages? What do you all think is the answer to those questions? Well, considering that profit maximization and exploitation rules in capitalist labor relations, we can easily foresee how low to medium ranked remote workers will be treated as second tier labor force with less earnings and less benefits. So relocated suburban living will most probably be cheaper, but will offer less to improve wealth standards. Contradiction number four. The great American South is where most of the new suburban developments are going to happen. This is simply because it offers large extensions of affordable land and cheaper labor costs to real estate developers. However, most scientists agree that the American South is also going to be the territory that bears the worst costs of climate change. And suburbanization will make it even costlier. This is intensifying the already record income inequality that permeates across the United States. Making reference to a major research on estimating economic damage for climate change in the United States that was published in 2017 by Science Magazine, climate change has the potential to impose the equivalent of a 20% tax on county level income. As we all suspect, energy prices will go to the roof. Agricultural yields will fall. Heat waves and drought will set off epidemics of all kinds of diseases. Mortality rates will rise and the overall price of living, or should I say surviving, will increase dramatically. Adding to these extreme consequences of climate change, of course, the environmental destruction that suburbanization brings will continue to wipe out more farmlands, forests, wetlands, and protected environmental areas. And the same can be said of the unsustainable reliance of the car-centric and energy-intensive lifestyle that already comes with suburban living. In short, young generations and persons with problems are not only forced to live outside the economic and social opportunity radius that cities offer, but are also being forced to be the ones that push environmental destruction to the brink and suffer its consequences. Contradiction number five. Over a million new single family homes and close to 400,000 apartment units were built in 2020. Housing construction hasn't been this high since 1990. But as predicted, this housing building boom is not for those that need a home. It is for the already well-stable households and corporations that want to make more profitable real estate investments. For these wealthy individuals and corporations, the staggering rise of property prices increased their wealth immensely, taking advantage of low interest rates, profitable refinancing, and the extraction of higher rent and sales prices to their now higher valued properties. The pandemic years have been a downward spiral of death for anyone that does not own a home, making the outer suburbs the only possible or plausible choice to home ownership. And this is if someone has savings, something that in the current economic climate is becoming less likely. The black white ownership gap, as well as the generational home ownership gap continues to accelerate to record highs without a sign of slowing down. So, what is to be done? There is no doubt that the future of the close to 60% of the adult Americans that live paycheck to paycheck is severely compromised. These are too many persons with a problem. These are 140 million adults 
that could not or cannot afford a home in a city today. With the majority being black and brown populations, of course. These populations are being relegated to rent motel rooms, to live in trailer parks, or placed at the mercy of climate change and the unsustainable, energy-consuming, car-centric lifestyles. We have arrived to the point where the only option for quote-unquote affordable living is far out in the suburbs. And in my view, this has to change. And it has to change now. The struggle for affordable housing in and around cities is more important than ever. And I encourage all of you to engage in it, even if you already own a home. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of grassroots campaigns around the country that are advocating and demanding drastic policy changes to increase housing access to young and low-income populations. Organizations such as the Right to the City Alliance, the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project, the Fair Housing Justice Center, the Housing Rights Initiative, need you to engage in their struggle because it's a struggle of everyone. It's really a struggle for the future. This is a serious problem that requires mass coalitions across the nation and large doses of creativity and hope. This is not something that can be addressed by one city, one county, or one region. Only organized nationwide initiatives that are pursuing new non-speculative models of cooperative housing, co-housing, community land trust, and the like, can have the power to push for a necessary drastic change. And you, need to be part of this. You have no choice. Your kids have no choice. The planet gives you no choice. The amount of housing right movements that have emerged in the last years is also outstanding. And I believe it's a huge glimpse of hope for a brighter future. This was another episode of Cities After. Thank you for listening and don't forget to subscribe.